On today's episode, we will be covering cybersecurity. How can you protect yourself? What attacks are currently being used? And what are some key ways that you can identify those sources of attack and make sure that you don't fall for the schemes that are being used to steal your information? Let's get into it. Game begin. Let's go. Lightning bolt, lightning bolt, Facebook ad, Facebook ad, Facebook ad. That's awesome. Well, welcome to episode 153 of the Crowdfunding Nerds. And today, myself, Sean, is joined by Jacob. How are you doing, Jacob? I'm doing great. So Jacob is our other Facebook ads master here at Crowdfunding Nerds. And um, it's kind of like, I kind of feel like I'm I'm a Qui-Gon Jinn and you're Obi-Wan Kenobi. And, exactly. Um, we uh, kind of don't have the hair to grow than one of those awesome Jedi Padawan ponytails or rat tails. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we both team up and we fight the Darth Maul of Facebook ads. Basically, we, we fight Facebook. Facebook is Darth Maul and we, we both fight him. And I think I'm, I'm probably going to, it's going to kill me at some stage. <laughs> so the reason why it's just us two, because Andrew has just had a lovely baby boy uh, with his beautiful wife and he's sort of out of action for a little while. So we're just going to jump into this very important topic, which I thought we should cover, which is privacy and cybersecurity. And you you might think, what does this have to do with crowdfunding? Well, a great deal. Um, And I have a real world example of this. There's a privacy community around a, a particular cryptocurrency called Monero. And they recently had a, a breach into their funds. They have a ongoing crowdfunding campaign, which allows the community to fund developers to, to develop certain initiatives within that community. And it's called the Community Crowdfunding System, CCS. And they recently had, whether it was through uh, some type of internal um, conflict where you know someone who was a developer st- just simply stole the money, or whether it was a hack, Whatever happened, they lost nearly half a million dollars of crowdfunded money um, in this debacle recently. So I figured now would be a good time to cover cybersecurity, privacy, and these important things. Because if it happened to them, and they're supposed to be (laughs) these cypherpunks who lead up this cryptocurrency privacy movement, it likely can happen to you. And uh, we just want to cover some basic safeguards. Now... I'm not completely alien to this. Uh, I'm a bit of a cypherpunk myself in terms of my my hobbies <laughs> outside of um, crowdfunding nerds. And I, I have done work for IT companies in terms of uh, compiling cybersecurity stuff. So we're actually going to be going over an old presentation I prepared years ago. But I think I was just looking at this again and I sent it to Jacob and Jacob's had a look over. But th- I think there's some basic points here with some basic solutions. This is for people to to be aware and to keep in mind. I think paranoia is good, but there's also bad paranoia, but you you just want you want to be safe and, and secure. I think one of the dangers with crowdfunding is that and Jacob, you probably you could you know you could probably understand this as well, is that when you raise a large amount of funds publicly, you are making yourself a target to criminals. Suddenly you know, bad actors now see that, oh, this individual or this company has just raised a bunch of money. <laughs> it would be it would be really good, uh, be really convenient for me to try and uh, narrow in and target target them. I don't know about you, Jake, but have you had any of our clients email you saying, hey, I got this strange email and should I respond? Has that ever happened to you? It happens very frequently, actually. I just got one yesterday from a from a client that said that they had received a message that was appeared to be from Facebook asking for account information. And if they didn't do certain things, their account would be deactivated and and that sort of thing. So it does happen very frequently. Yeah. So in the show notes, we we will include a link of the official Facebook support domains. So Facebook is or Meta is ever going to contact you. They'll only do so through these listed domains. So we'll include a link to that in the show notes because this happens a lot, especially when you just run ads. And there's always some type of fear connected to it. It's like, oh, you've just breached copyright laws. And if you don't respond in 12 ac- twelve hours, we're taking legal action. And you know people are freaking out and sending us, sending us emails. <laughs> and they, they usually are all fake. And the easiest way to, dis- to dispel them or to uh, just mark them as spam or as, as phishing spam 
is to simply go to the, the resource that we will include in the show notes and just to check the domain, who's, who sent it and where has it come from and does it match the, the domains? So that's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, and also to be aware of anything that's kind of using fear and urgency, then you should be uh, doubly suspicious of, of those types of things. But anyway, I think we should, we should dive into this. So we have seven cybersecurity points that we will cover and we can, uh, we might bring up some more as we go along, but this might give a good overview of some of the precautions that you can take or just some of the, to, to know some of the attacks that the bad actors can use. Um, some of them are, are obvious, some are less obvious. So I know, Jacob, I don't know if you want to uh, start by going through the, the first one. Uh, let's look at shoulder surfing. <laughs> shoulder surfing. What this is very simply is if you're ever working in a public space, this could be in a cafe, it could be on a, on a train with a laptop. And this is simply someone looking over your shoulder <laughs> and just looking at your screen. And you might say, well, I would never do that, but you'd be surprised of just how, you know, you might be, you might, might be somewhere public and working on something, not really realizing how sensitive the information is. And again, it could just be someone simply looking over your shoulder and just looking at what you're doing. And that by then they might, you know, grab a password or they might uh, see some, some important details that will help them leverage in like some type of other attack to you at another point. So the, the kind of how you combat this is to always position yourself with your screen facing a wall of some sort but the easiest way so that it's impossible for someone to look over your shoulder. Uh, you also need to be careful of people sitting next to you, like directly next to you, because again, they could just look into, <laughs> look into your screen, but you can purchase a privacy screen filters. And these are, these are like on like a plastic film that you could put over your, your laptop screen that when someone looks at a, you know, a 90 degree angle or foot, a 60 degree angle, it will appear black to them. It's almost like the tinted screens you get on cars. Sure. So it just means if someone is next to you, they, they won't be able to see into your screen. They have to be sort of be looking up straight. For. So that, that is uh, something that you can use if you do frequent uh, public areas and, and you do some work. So that's that is probably the first thing. <laughs> Sometimes the uh, the easiest uh, and most simple ones are the ones that catch people, unfortunately. Yeah. This is the one as a parent of young kids that I've become most accustomed to, especially now we're getting close to the holidays. It's Christmas shopping time. And so my wife and I are constantly having to be vigilant that we don't have a, a four or five year old sneaking through the house behind us when we're looking up Christmas gift ideas on the, <laughs> on the computer. So, <laughs> might be so, shoulder so, swift. so a good way to train yourself is if you have small children is to, to practice uh, searching for Christmas gifts while they're still in the house and make sure you can stay uh, that you've avoided any, any spoiled Christmas gifts. Yeah. Or you can just get a, like a, an Oculus VR headset and then you can just work with your screen attached <laughs> to your eyeballs and then no one will see what you're doing. <laughs> Great. So the, the next cybersecurity slash privacy attack. Brute force. Brute force. Uh, this is when someone takes a wrench and threatens to hit you over the head. <laughs> no, it's not. It's a, this is a type of a trial and error uh, password breaking. So someone will run some type of software that will go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> no, A, one, two, three, four. And it, it basically runs the script that will constantly try to crack your password, uh, essentially. Um, so this is called a brute force attack. So this is why often when you will see Google has those uh, capture things that you have to, you know, select the buses and <laughs> select the <laughs> stairs. And then you're always like, is that, is that pixel within the, in that square or not? That's to essentially stop brute force. It stops, stop machines. from just constantly trying to put in passwords and, and then crack your, crack your password. And, um, the, the solution to this, which to be fair, a lot of uh, websites now have these type of bot uh, and, and filters, uh, even sending you email notifications if someone's logged in from a new location thing. So a lot of these are built in. But one way to, to sort of prevent any type of uh, password compromise or th these types of brute force attacks is just to have strong passwords. The stronger your password, the harder it is for a, a key system to crack and break. And 
I find that a solution to good passwords is to take uh, something that rhymes because you can remember it. And then using the, the first letter of each word and that rhyming. So let's say, for example, um, all that is gold does not glitter. <laughs> so you can uh, take this uh, Lord of the Rings quote and then, you know, all, so A is, is your first letter. All that, so T would be the next one. So all that is gold does not glitter. And then you could even, you could continue that stanza. So it's quite long, but it looks like jumbled text, but that, that is essentially your password and you can remember it. And then you can also add in some special characters to make it harder. So you could use brackets in between each word or you could put in you know, at symbols or something like that. Something that you, you can remember, but that's, that's a way to easily create strong passwords. Another thing is two-factor authentication, which we always recommend our our clients to use is to enable two-factor authentication. So even if your password is compromised or, or broken, it will require an additional layer of uh, two-factor authentication. I always re- would recommend using the the apps, not the the, the SMMs, the text two-factor authentication. Um, and what and what is the reason behind that, Sean? Well, I think the well, a lot more of your information is re- is released when you receive a text. So okay. when it comes to a privacy issue, it's better that if, if if any information was to be compromised, there's less information that's been released through the app. Whilst with a text, it's, it's quite a lot more information in terms of your geolocation and things like that. Another thing is if you lose your phone <laughs> or your SIM, um, you, you, that can be quite compromising. The advantage is that the advantage is if you do change your phone, you just have to change your SIM and then all your two-factor authentication stuff carries over with it. But I think it's better to just uh, ca- export the keys for your two-factor authentication or just destroy your key, disable it, and then re-enable it when you get a new phone. I think find that's a better system than having it connected to your mobile phone. Now, I know some people even use password generators. And I I don't tend to use those because I, I kind of feel like it's a it's a sing it's like a single point of failure because if someone was to hack your password wallet <laughs> then all your passwords are then compromised um, or, or you're putting a you're putting a great deal of faith in a third party to keep your passwords secure or to encrypt them and how do you know they're actually encrypted just because it says it's encrypted doesn't mean it is so I I tend to avoid any type the the less middlemen you can have in your your cybersecurity and privacy philosophy, I think the better. So you kind of just want to cut out any type of unnecessary middleman. Yeah, moving right along. Uh, the next one is router finder. Which, what do you think this is, Jacob? Uh, does this have to do with uh, locating uh, your your home router and any stored passwords that may be located on your on your home router? Yeah, exactly what that is. Not many people know that most internet service providers, when they ship out your default router, they often, the the passwords that are connected to those by default, the, you know, the jumbled letters, those are publicly available, <laughs> those passwords. Uh, there's websites where you can find the actual model of the router you're using and the password associated with that particular model, kind of the factory default. So it's really important that you change the password to your Wi-Fi because that means anyone can just drive up to your house. Oh, look, at this is your, your Wi-Fi, the, the ID it's, it's sending out, and you need to change that too. And then they can just find the, the actual router number and then hack your Wi-Fi just by using the default uh, password. So, uh, wow. And then if they get access to your router through your password, they can even then get into your router and then they can start doing other things in terms of seeing w- what you're doing and blocking certain websites or just spying on you and, you know, trying to get your Kickstarter login details or something. <laughs> so <laughs> it's important that you, you change your, your Wi-Fi passwords and you change your Wi-Fi um, display name. I can't remember what it's called, WWID, whatever it is. Peter uh, Wilson's looked at this, but yeah, you want to change the default settings. Because there is a website, as you find it here, it is called routerpasswords.com. <laughs> and that's the website wow. you can use to find uh, default. Uh, another one is Advanced IP Scanner. It's a piece of software that can scan the area for IP addresses. And then they, they can then um, 
hack you or find your IP address or your router address through that as well and connect to your router. So those are the two things they would use. They would find your password and then find your IP for your for your router and then just hack into it that way. So yeah, the simple solution is change your passwords, change the default passwords of your equipment. Yeah. And with some of these last couple, kind of what you touch on is it's really just a matter of getting past convenience. It, it takes about 20 seconds worth of work to to change a password or to uh, move away from a default setting or to make something that's a, uh, that takes just a, a hair longer to do. And it, and it sets you up long-term to be far more secure than just taking the easy way. And well, I just plug my router in and now we're good to go. I'm connected to the internet, internet and nothing could ever go wrong. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. You, a lot of these security things is a balance between convenience and security. So you can make things super secure, but then it might be so inconvenient that, you know, it's like you could, you could build a moat around your house, right? With a drawbridge and it'd be super inconvenient to, you know, go in and out of your house. And would it, is it necessary? Or are you really under that kind of threat that you need something like that? So there's those types of obligations to, to keep in mind. Yeah. So yeah, you need to change your SSID. That's the, the term, not the WID or whatever it is. Yeah. So your SSID is what you need to change and change your Wi-Fi password and your your router display name great so moving on yeah and the next one is social engineering and i think this one will likely touch on a lot of the the things that we've noticed clients running into with with emails claiming that something is wrong with their account or that they need to take action to prevent something from from happening yeah so this is some type of human manipulation where someone's pretending to be some type of support or legal department or, and they're trying to get information from you. So I think probably the most famous one is the Ethiopian prince who has uh, lost some money or has some money stopped in Ethiopia. And if you send a, a certain amount of money, he can unlock all his other money and he'll give you a share. And that's just kind of the, um, the social engineering, some type of story or fable that will get you to lower your guard. So yeah, there's, there's certain characteristics about social engineering just to, keep in mind that attackers will use and their authority, intimidation, consensus, and urgency. So those are the the four things to just be aware of. So the authority, hey, I'm an IT expert from Meta, and I'm just here to inform you that uh, you have broken our policy. And so they then intimidate you um, or threaten bad behavior. Um, and then they can even use consensus. So uh, not only have I detected this, but our Instagram support system has also flagged <laughs> it on our or whatever. And then the urgency would be, you have to respond within eight hours. Otherwise we will take legal action or something to this effect. So there's, there's always some type of um, urgency connected to it. So authority, intimidation, consensus, and urgency. Those are the four characteristics that are used and just to be aware of them. And if you get a this dodgy email, uh, don't feel that you have to take urgent action. You know, maybe to be very sure before you, you, you respond to them. Um, another way where emails can be spoofed is where uh, they can almost disguise their addresses. So for, ex for example, like a, an M, they could use like two N's next to each other. It kind of looks like an M, you know, where it's like Microsoft or, or something like that, where uh, they use letters in a way that can disguise the, the true address of the sender. So it could look, it could look like a, a legitimate email from Meta. But the you know, the M and the meta is a it's a trick, <laughs> right? And I think with some of these, it's it's helpful because I do think there are things that you can look for to identify whether an email that you've received is coming from a, a fake source or a false source. They definitely are getting better um, in in making them look more more valid. Um, I think you used to be able to jump in and be like, there would be just rife with misspellings and misplaced punctuation and that's usually a dead giveaway that it's it's not it's not valid uh but some of it just taking a little bit of time before you immediately respond i think their hope is that with that urgency urgency language is that you will just immediately jump in and click in and give them what they want because you want to take care of it right now um whereas if you stop for a second and look a lot of times the the email addresses that they come from uh don't match up with what would be coming from an official source um, or even for, I guess, our clients, especially if you're running ads through Facebook, uh, 
if you get an email that says that your account has been compromised or hacked or your ads are no longer running because you violated a certain policy, you can very quickly log into your Facebook business settings page uh, and it will show you if there's a, a flag on your account. Uh, and so there's a there's a couple of things that you can quickly double check for yourself whether there's an issue or not. Um, if, if an email says that your account has been suspended or that nothing's being run and you need to give this certain information, if you log into your Facebook business settings and your ads are still running and there are no flags on your account, then it's very likely that email that you just received is a is a false email. Yeah, there is. I know there used to be a a service where if you forwarded uh, these fake emails to a, a certain address, it was called Rescan. We include a link in the show notes. I, I don't know if it's still going, but it was run by a, uh, a company based in New Zealand, and then it would use AI to essentially waste the time of the scammer. So it just ask all these qualifying questions and just was in these endless e automated email responses using AI to kind of waste their time. And so that's something that you could do if you get one of these fake, e fake emails, just forward it to something like Rescan. Uh, you can look into that. I'll include a link in the, in the show notes, but that's quite a fun way to you know, deal with these people. And if they're wasting their time with a, you know, a fake AI bot, then they're not could it be harming other people or, or getting into their information? So it's one way to sort of occupy their time. And yeah, great. So the the next next one on our list. The next one on our list is fishing, and yeah, so not in is... the fun kind of fishing that we do in Kentucky. <laughs> yeah. So this fishing is just a way to to try and get people's information. Uh, so fishing spams, you know. It, it almost falls into this social engineering segment where they're trying to get your login details through an email co communication or get some information about you, uh, perhaps your, your date of birth. So that's something you should, you should really guard is your date of birth. I know a lot of people put it up on Facebook, but you should always put a fake date of birth up on Facebook because one of the first things your bank is going to ask you to confirm your identity is your date of birth. So uh, and a lot of other systems do this as well. So you, you want to make sure that your date of birth is never public. And if you if it is public, you just have a fake one that you use. Um, yeah, so finding personal information about you to either to impersonate you, uh, to get into certain systems to log in is what phishing attacks are about. And I, we sort of covered some of these, but maybe the one that is most notable will be something like spyware, where if you you know download a program and you accidentally download a, another system that spies on you, <laughs> a software that can send information back to uh, your attacker. Uh, and again, they'll use this information to fake your identity or log into your systems and, and steal from you. So you can mark things with emails like this within Gmail and a bunch of other ones as phishing spam. And you should always do that just so that their AI and their algorithm is understanding certain attack vectors from people. So if you do have something like this coming, then just always report it and um, you, you won't see it again. And then it also sort of trains the, the systems. Right. Yeah, so... So I think that the next one is one that uh, definitely has the, the vibe of being spy-affiliated or Jason Bourne. It's the USB killer. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll get back to that. Just in terms of solutions for, for phishing, you can find if your information is being compromised, like your email. If you go to a website that is called haveibeenpwned.com, so P-W-N-E-D, haveibeenpwned.com, if you put your email in there, it can see if, you, if your email is in, incorporating some type of data breach from an email server or something. So that might be worth doing. You might need to change your email after doing that. Um, yeah, another solution is to use VPNs that kind of obscure your, your IP address, which can be helpful. Don't use VPNs when using Facebook. They will ban you <laughs> pretty quickly because uh, they see that as suspicious. But I think whenever you're doing anything else on the internet, uh, using VPNs is um, essential. The one I recommend is melvad.net, the one I use. Uh, I recommend it because it doesn't require any personal information for you. You don't even need a credit card. You can pay it with cryptocurrency. So, and there's no kind of connection between your identity and then your account with this, which is good because that's why you have a VPN. You have a v VPN because you're trying to disguise your IP and your identity. 
So uh, it, it, it's better if you can even sign up for the, the service without even having to give over any information about yourself. So that's M-U-L-L-V-A-D.net. That's the VPN I use, and I would I would recommend that other people use if they want to get a VPN and, and hide as I'll obscure some of their online identity. Yes, so going back to the USB killer, so this might something you might not think about. You know, so let's say Jacob, you uh, created a a game, highly successful crowdfunding campaign, and someone in your community was like, "Hey, I want to send you a a, a gift," and uh, you know, you send them your address, and then they then you open up this parcel. Eventually, comes in the post, and in that parcel. Is a USB key. What are you going to do? Plug it in, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you probably plug it in um, without thinking. It's like, oh, this looks interesting. But there are certain attack vectors that people can have with USB devices, which is, uh, yes, these could be malware in the form of worms. The USB killer, uh, which, <laughs> which is literally a, a piece of hardware that if you put into your computer, will fry your motherboard. And it can do it instantaneously. So uh, if someone wants to, you know, destroy your computer, they can send you a USB killer, and you think, oh, this is a, you know, file from a friend, or maybe it's a funny joke or something, and you, you stick it into your computer. Next, you know, your entire computer is fried, and your hard drives have been destroyed, and everything on your computer is is essentially gone. So always be careful. There, there are things called USB condoms, which is a gross name, but they exist where it's almost acts as like an intermediate, which is designed to stop these type of attacks. You might want to invest in something like that if you are getting a USB. So, so, but I think the general rule is be careful what devices you plug into your systems uh, because there are these type of attacks and you don't know what kind of software in terms of worms that can be uploaded onto your system and then uh, clean your information. Another one is like kiosks. So I don't know if you, you go to like public spaces and like, oh, it's like free charging port and you plug in your phone. Uh, you have no idea <laughs> what kind of connection that is or uh, what permissions that, that you've granted it by plugging in. So be very careful with those types of things as well, especially if you're traveling. So I'd always recommend if you're traveling, carry your own kind of USB power blocks. If your phone does run out, you can plug it into that and you're not dependent on these kind of quote unquote free power stations, which are often used as attack vectors for uh, you know tourists or business people who are like, oh, my phone's about to die. I'll just plug it in here and charge it. And then it's, you know, <laughs> it, it's compromised sure. with your devices. So it's, it's things like this just to be aware of. So yeah, we'll put a link in the show notes of a USB killer in action. You can see it, you know, someone plugs it in instantly, the laptop dies. So, um, wow. Yeah. Okay. And then, yes, yeah, so the final thing on our, our list of things to be aware of uh, is zero day. So zero day. These are the attacks we don't know about yet. So uh, you know, we, we've we've covered some of the attacks that we know about. You know, some techniques in terms of people looking over your shoulder or installing uh, malware through a USB you plug in or uh, hacking your your router Wi-Fi systems. But the zero day attacks are the ones you don't know about. So you can you can only kind of learn about them after the fact. This is why you have a lot of large firms who will pay hackers to try break their system. And then once they break their system, they will pay them and then they'll go back and and, and fix their system so that th those types of zero day tax can't happen. So this is something just to be aware of is that there might be some type of vulnerability within Kickstarter or GameFound or and something that we don't even know about yet. So to, to be aware of those things as well. Um, I don't know, in terms of solutions, it, it, this is why like, like doing updates on your, your software is important. And it's probably why there's so many updates because they suddenly realize, oh, there's a vulnerability that we have to update our software. So keeping your things updated. And then another solution to this will could be redirecting certain traffic that you are not uh, too sure about or just have systems in place that can redirect internet traffic that uh, you don't have uh, or you haven't granted permissions to, like a firewall. Um, a great piece of software to do this would be NextDNS, which is actually a really good way to block ads. <laughs> so a lot of people talk about ad blocking, but you can actually block ads on your DNS level, which is like your routing level, so that when, let's say you get an ad from Google, it will, instead of displaying the ad, it just redirects the ad to what's like 
it's called a black hole. So it's just kind of like, yeah, I'll take the ad and then they throw it away and you know, the server thinks it's been displayed, but it's actually just been rerouted to a, a black hole. And you can do this through NextDNS, but NextDNS doesn't just block ads. It can also block other things like known phishing sites, uh, known you know, sites with malware or harmful sites, essentially. Uh, it can even block some of the um, telemetry, which is the information that your operating system sends back to Microsoft, for example. Um, so if you want to block some of that, you can use something like NextDNS as well, which is helpful. Um, yeah, so, and sort of a brief overview, we have shoulder surfing, being careful where you sit in cafes and public spaces, brute force, make sure you have strong passwords, two-factor authentication, uh, router finding or router hacking, so make sure you update your passwords from the defaults. Social engineering, be careful of emails you get. Phishing, which is people trying to get information from you online. Make sure that you don't publicize your date of birth anywhere. USB killers, be careful what devices you stick into your, your systems. And then zero day attacks, make sure you keep things updated and uh, you don't let uh, things fall behind because there could be attacks that people find out and then your systems are updated. Great. And I think another, maybe just overall to think that if you are raising lots of funds online publicly, the likelihood of you to be targeted for someone to attack you is going to increase. So just to be, just to be a little bit more aware, not paranoid and, and scared, but just to be a bit more aware that you might start getting strange emails or there might be um, reasons for people to attack you. And there's there's a reason to take extra precautions when you have r- raised a lot of money publicly uh, that these types of things could suddenly start appearing in your inbox or whatever. Sure. Sean, do you know, are there any provisions that GameFound or Kickstarter or other crowdfunding platforms offer or things that they, they do to try to prevent uh, things like this or offer some sort of assurances to, to their clients that they are uh, working to keep their information secure? I'm not entirely sure, but you'd, you'd have to if you're running an enterprise that big. Um, and if anyone who's re- anyone who's run their own WordPress site will very quickly know how how often your a site is attacked by bots or people trying to brute force to break into your your admin login, um, there's a great plugin for WordPress called Word Word Fence, which I recommend. Uh, even the f- the free version of it is is quite useful in terms of being able to protect you from these types of things. But it's very common, a different type of backdoor attacks and and things. So, um, yeah, the, the more that you are aware of the certain attacks that can be done, then the better prepared you are to defend yourself from them should you see them come up. The one thing to also keep in mind is that anything on the internet which isn't end-to-end encrypted is not private. It's public. So uh, but even things like your WhatsApp messages where WhatsApp says, well, it's end-to-end encrypted. And yes, it is end-to-end encrypted, but they hold the encryption key <laughs> and you don't know if, if they get compromised, if are they able to then make your um, messages public, uh, they could do. You know, if, the, if a government, the government comes to them and say, Hey, we want the encryption key to these messages and they, w- they will hand it over. So j- just know that, that if it isn't end to end encrypted, it isn't private. And this includes email. I think a lot of people think email is like a private message, but it's not. Email is actually public. It's open. And anyone can see the the full body text of email messages that go through an uh, email server. So if someone was to run an email server, and if your email was being routed through that server, they can read your emails. And the only way to keep your emails private would be to use something like PGP, which stands for pretty good privacy, is what you could use to encrypt your email body text. So even at that, you can't encrypt the header and footer or the sender, but you can encrypt the uh, the body of the text, uh, and that would be useful if you're sending sensitive sen- sensitive information over email. It's a little bit complicated to set up because you have to generate a encryption key and then share it with the person who you want to communicate with, and then they have to authenticate it, and then you kind of create this link. But if you want something that's a little bit more uh, streamlined in terms of an app you can download, I'd recommend either Session or Simple X Chat. Probably Simple X Chat because it doesn't require any um 
any information from you, not even a, a an ID that it creates. Uh, so it's, you install that, you share a link with someone, and then it uses onion routing and encryption to communicate um, between you and this, this other person. So that's probably the, the most private and secure you could, you could do in terms of just like an app. But other than that, then Session would be another a great one to, to use, which also has end-to-end -end encryption that runs over the onion routing, which is a way to kind of bounce your communication from all these different routers to ob obscure it a bit. It makes it harder oh. to in intercept. Yeah, so just keep in mind, if it isn't encrypted, it's not private. <laughs> so, that, so it's just like these things that you think are private. And this is why they don't call them private messages anymore on social media because they aren't private. They're direct messages and they're completely open to you know, Facebook or Instagram or whatever platform it is. And if their security was to be compromised, within your messages are also can be compromised. So just keep that in mind. Uh, maybe some things for people to look into if, if they're interested. Um, there are sort of privacy oriented hardware that you can get, like in terms of phones and even laptops. So Librem.one is a website where you can buy privacy oriented. They have their own operating systems that have a lot of the maybe tracking and other things that like Windows would have uh, are, are disabled. They've got their own sort of um, internal chips. So if you, if you are doing anything that is super sensitive uh, and you are dealing with large amounts of, of money, I probably would recommend uh, using a Librem 1 laptop that's running a, a form of Linux. Um, I think they use Pure OS. It's the one that, that, that they've created. But there's also Cubes, which is another operating system that's privacy oriented. Because not many people know, and Jacob, I don't know if you know this, but on every N Intel processing chip and every AMD processing chip, post 2006, they have a essentially a, a backdoor. It's a hidden operating system within the firmware of these chips. And on Intel, it's called the Intel Management Engine, or ME. And on AMD chips, it's called the AMD Platform Security Processor. <laughs> and it's essentially a web server that um, can be tapped into remotely and that can access everything on your, on your system. So this was wow. probably created by uh, government agencies, if they ever need to get access to your computer and, and 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 systems in it, then then they can. So the way to avoid that is to you can kind of like update the firmware on your your processing chips, which is very dangerous because if it doesn't happen, if you don't do it right, then you can destroy your your processing your chip. Or you can buy yeah, something like the the Librem dot one uh, laptops, which have different chips or these or they've they've updated the chip so that they don't have these these back doors baked into them. So if you are super concerned about your privacy and, and about keeping your business things locked in and secure, then you might want, want to invest in, in, in something like that. Yeah, that was something I was not familiar with at all. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's in terms of privacy, you know, as, as we said that it, it comes down to convenience and, and threat levels. Um, you know, the, it's probably unlikely that, the NSA or FBI are going to be hacking into your computer <laughs> and, and seeing on your files. But um, if you are dealing with large sums, that could potentially be an attack area area where people could break in. So you want to be at least aware that these things exist. Um, I think even sure. Mark Zuckerberg covers his uh, webcam with tape. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> but that's good to that's good to know. So to summarize, in today's episode, we looked at a number of different ways that hackers or malicious sources can interfere or interact with uh, your important information, especially in regards to your crowdfunding campaigns and steps that you can take to protect yourself from, from losing uh, potentially money, but also personal information that may pertain to other business day-to-day uh, -day, uh, sources. So, so when it comes down to it, to quote G.I. Joe, now that you know and knowing is half the battle, um, being aware of ways that your information may be compromised, you can take very practical steps to ensure that you don't lose um, things that are very key to your business or key to your day to day functioning. Uh, oftentimes, it, all it takes is just a simple uh, push back past what is convenient and take practical steps to ensure that your passwords are, are secure, ensure that you're encrypted, that you're not trusting. Uh, possibly suspicious sources. 
And for those of the, our listeners that are even using a source, even if it's if it's us that are helping to manage a crowdfunding account for you, uh, there's no harm in reaching out and asking for help. If you ever sus- suspect that a uh, potential attempt is being made to access your account, whether that be through uh, an email or a, a phishing site or something on those lines, uh, it doesn't hurt to reach out to ask and to ask someone to check in. Is there is there something that looks suspicious about this? Uh, don't fall prey to the sense of urgency that often comes with some of these attacks. Uh, make sure that you are are taking your time and realizing that uh, just because there's an ultimatum respond within eight hours does not mean that someone is going to break down your door uh, within that eight hour timeline. Uh, this is not a, a hostage situation. You are fully in control. Uh, and with the steps that Sean has provided, I think that you're well equipped uh, to make sure that you have a successful uh, and gainful attempt at running a crowdfunding campaign. So with that, that will conclude our episode today. Uh, we thank you for tuning in to another episode of Crowdfunding Nerds. Uh, be sure to reach out if you are not already and join our community for more insider access and help and tune in to another episode next week. Well, that's all the time we have for this week's episode of Crowdfunding Nerds. For more resources, articles, and to listen to past podcasts, please visit us at crowdfundingnerds.com. And if you have a crowdfunding question, we also have a page on our site where you can send a message directly to us. Please visit crowdfundingnerds.com forward slash question. And if your question is a great question, we may include it in a future podcast. Thank you all again for listening to this week's episode, and we'll see you next week. Stay nerdy. Stay nerdy.